Well, as we come to worship this morning, I do want to give you a very warm welcome as you're joining with us here and for those who are tuning in online as well too. As we come to worship, I'd like to read Psalm 138 this morning. I'm just going to read the whole psalm, so I'd invite you to turn uh, to it with me, please. Psalm 138. And the psalmist writes these words. I give you thanks, O Lord, with my whole heart. Before the gods, I sing your praise. I bow down towards your holy temple and give thanks to your name for your steadfast love and your faithfulness. For you have exalted above all things your name and your word. On the day I called, you answered me. My strength of soul you increased. All the kings of the earth shall give you thanks, O Lord, for they have heard the words of your mouth. And they shall sing of the ways of the Lord. For great is the glory of the Lord. For though the Lord is high, he regards the lowly. But the haughty he knows from afar. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you preserve my life. You stretch out your hand against the wrath of my enemies. And your right hand delivers me. The Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. Your steadfast love, O Lord, endures forever. Do not forsake the work of your hands. And this is a psalm of David, a psalm of personal testimony of David. He's given thanks to God for his faithfulness, for his loyal, steadfast love. And we see that also David's experience of God in the past is what sustains him and gives him hope, not only in the present, but gives him hope for the future as well. For he knows that God will fulfill his purpose for him. And that's one of the themes of our passage that we're looking at in Genesis today, that God will fulfill his purpose. And so as we come to worship the Lord today, let us be still and know that he is God. And let us express even our commitment and our trust to him as we sing this chorus as we begin. Be still and know that I am God. Let's stand as we sing this, please. <laughs> Let's continue in our worship together as we pray. Heavenly Father, we do want to give you thanks. We do want to sing your praises today and give praise to your name for your steadfast love and for your faithfulness towards us. Father, help us to even take time to pause, to be still before you, to even consider what you have done in our life. But to consider, Lord, even what you are doing, even in our life, even at this moment. Father, maybe even you're using a time of of trial, a time of even difficulty at the moment. But Father, how you even move in these situations and use it for our ultimate good and for your glory. Father, we recognize, Lord, that though we walk in the midst of trouble, Lord, you're the one who preserves our life. You're the one who upholds us. You're the one who's able to deliver us. And Father, we know that you will fulfill your purposes for us, Lord. For we declare, as the psalmist David did, that your steadfast love 
endures forever. And so, Lord, we ask that you would look upon us. Lord, look upon us as a, as a church, as we recognize our great need of you. Lord, how we can do nothing without you. Our Lord, we ask that you would lead us. Our Lord, we ask that you would guide us and that you would help us. Lord, just for even ourselves as a church and for individuals, Lord, help us even in our own individual witness. Help us, Lord, even in our, our families and our neighborhoods as well to declare of who you are and what you mean to us. And Father, often we don't realize how, how people do look at our lives, how they can see, Lord, whether what we say we believe, Lord, we actually believe by how we live. Father, help us to be just people, Lord, declaring your glory. Signposts, Lord, pointing the way to you. And Lord, even just in the things that we're seeking even to organize, even in the summer, Lord, just even the, um, the Holiday Bible Club, Lord, we just even ask for your help, Lord, as we start to make preparations for this soon. And Father, we ask that you would just provide, Lord, that even that help that we would need as well. And Lord, grant us your help once again today as we just turn to your word, as we seek to honor and to glorify your name, even through the preaching of it. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we can truly declare that we worship a great God, one who, as we say, does accomplish his purposes even in our lives. And so let's sing of God's greatness now. Well, the splendor of the King, how great is our God. We'll just stay seated as we sing this, please. Sing with me how great is our God. 
Well, let's turn in our Bibles to Genesis chapter 18. Genesis chapter 18. And then after we read this, I'll ask Alfie to come up and just bring the announcements to us and then also pray for some of the needs of our church as well too. But before that, let's read Genesis 18. So last week we looked at Genesis 17 and we talked about the covenant God made with Abraham. And we saw that that wasn't a a new covenant as such, but rather an expansion of the promises that were already made. Uh, But there were also new dimensions to the covenant, really, the the commitment reacquired, uh, sorry, the commitment required from Abraham, that he was to walk before God and be blameless. But there's also the sign of the covenant given. The Lord had once more reaffirmed the promises of descendants, the promises of land. Uh, But we saw that some time had gone past to this point. And still Abraham and Sarah were waiting for the fulfillment of this, the fulfillment of this promised son. But now the Lord said in Genesis 17 that Sarah will bear a son and it will be in a year's time. And the Lord says he'll establish a covenant with him and the generations that follow. But now we see in this chapter that this is not the end of the matter. So Genesis 18 verses 1 to 15. Let's read it together. And the Lord appeared to him by the oaks of Mamre as he sat at the door of his tent in the heat of the day. And he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, three men were standing in front of him. And when he saw them, he ran from the tent door to meet them and bowed himself to the earth and said, O Lord, if I have found favor in your sight, do not pass by your servant. Let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. And while I bring a morsel of bread that you may refresh yourselves, and after that you may pass on, since you have come to your servant." So they said, do as you have said. And Abraham went quickly into the tent to Sarah and said, quick, three seas of fine flour, knead it and make cakes. And Abraham ran to the herd and took a calf tender and good. And he gave it to a young man who prepared it quickly. Then he took curds and milk and the calf that he prepared and set it before them. And he stood by them under the tree while they ate. And they said to him, where is Sarah, your wife? And he said, she is in the tent. And the Lord said, I will surely return to you about this time next year. And Sarah, your wife, shall have a son. And Sarah was listening at the tent door behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced in years. The way of women had ceased to be with Sarah. And so Sarah laughed herself, saying, After I'm worn out and my Lord is old, shall I have pleasure? The Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh and say, Shall I indeed bear a child now that I am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the appointed time I will return to you, but about this time next year Sarah shall have a son. But Sarah denied it, saying, I did not laugh, for she was afraid. And he said, No, but you did laugh. And we'll end our reading there. At verse 15, knowing that the Lord will bless his word. I'm going to ask Alfie to come up and um, bring the announcements to us and then also to pray for us as well. Well, bear with me this morning because I have one or two things I want to expand with the announcements, but don't forget this evening at 6 o'clock, we'll be back here for our prayer time before our evening service at 6.30. And then, as you come in this morning, you may have got this on your seat. It's the Baptist Missions Prayer News. If you haven't got one, uh, ask me and I'll get you one for later on. But the reason I've put that on your seats this morning is we're Tuesday night, our midweek. It's going to be a missions focus night. And we're going to be thinking about the work of Baptist Missions in our various mission fields. Baptist missions workers only get prayer support and financial support from fellow Baptists. They can't go to other churches and do deputation and make the needs known. So it's important that we as Baptists know about what's happening in Baptist missions and support the work. So if you can come along on Tuesday night, you'll be informed. But take the leaflet home with you Read the various mission prayer requests and come prepared on Tuesday night to pray specifically about the work of some of the missionaries that you will see on this sheet today. 
information is the source of our prayer life. So the more information we have, the more intelligently we can pray for our mission family. Then Wednesday is our Silver Thread special. Instead of meeting in the church here, we're going to Harrison's at Grey Abbey, and we're going to have tea and scones and tray bakes and maybe one or two other treats. See all you people who don't go to Silver Threads? See what you're missing. So the bus will be leaving earlier than normally. It will leave the church here at 1.30. And for those who don't want to travel by car, meet the bus at Cumber Cemetery Car Park at 1.50. There should be some seats in the bus to take those who want to go to Harrison's. And we'll be arriving there at 3 3 o'clock, leaving about 4.30, and returning back to the cemetery car park about 5.15. So if you haven't given Kathleen your name that you want to go, then give her that today so that we can confirm with Harrison's the numbers he will be catering for. Now, we want to come to the Lord in prayer, pray for these issues, but also other issues that need to be prayerfully remembered. We want to think about our folks who associate with the fellowship who were unwell and can't be with us. We want to think of Audrey and Edith and Ken, for Willie and Nan, for Ruby and Derek, Billy McVeigh, Billy McClelland, for Bert, Yvonne, all of whom are sick and can't be with us. Well, Nan's with us, thankfully. But we want to think, too, of Jackie's parents, both elderly, and Jackie has been looking after them for the last little while, and Jackie is very tired back and forward, back and forward to Port of Oge to look after them. So pray for them as well. And also, if you get the Baptist magazine, you'll get the Baptist uh, prayer diary. And today, being the second day of the month, the churches and wish, work, work, workers we want to be praying for is the Bally Crocken Church, Pastor Watson and Benjamin McKay, the Bally Cullen Church in Dublin, Pastor Jeff Hay and Philomena Fitzpatrick, the Ballygill Martin Church, Pastor Seamus Bradley, Ballykeel Church and Andrew Campbell, and then the Association Executive Committee, the Principal of the Baptist College, Johnny McLaughlin, and our new President, Pastor Edwin Yurt, and retired Pastor Lindsay Allen. We're going to pray for all of these people just now collectively, so let's just bow in prayer. Gracious Father, we thank you for the privilege again of coming into your presence, and we thank you for your goodness to each one of us that you've given us a measure of health and strength to be out with us this morning. And Lord, we just pray that as we meet together, we may be conscious of your presence. We think to you of those who are unable to be with us. We've mentioned them by name, and we collectively lift them to you, and we just ask that where they are, and whatever the situation they find themselves in, that they may find you to be the God of all grace and all comfort, and the God who heals. And we thank you that your word teaches us that the effectual prayer of a righteous man availeth much. And we just thank you, Lord, that you are a God who not only hears our prayers, but you're a God who answers our prayers. And we just thank you for the measure of health that you've given to so many of our folks. We thank you for the measure of recovery you've given to Ken and for him being at home. And we just pray to you to continue his healing touch upon him and for Audrey, for Edith, for for Willie and Nan, for Derek and Ruby, for Billy McVeigh and Billy McClelland, for Bert, for Yvonne, and we pray for Jackie and her parents as well as they seek to adapt to new situations in their lives. We just ask you to undertake for them. We pray too for our fellow churches. We think of the church in Billy Crocken and Pastor Watson and Benjamin Mackay, for the Bally Cullen Church in Dublin, for Jeff Hay and Philomena as they seek to minister there, for the Bally Martin Church, for Seamus Bradley as he ministers in that area of Belfast, for the Bally Keel Church and for Pastor Campbell. We think to you of the Association Executive Committee, give them wisdom and discernment in the decisions that they make as they meet. We think of the college new principal as Johnny McLaughlin settles into that role and we pray for the new student intake that will 
happen for September. We just prayed out that you would put it into the hearts of men and women to apply for, mem- for enrollment for the college courses. We thank you too for the students who graduated in May. We just pray that you would open up doors of opportunity and service for those students. Thank you for the students who know what their situation will be in the future ministry. We pray to you for our new president, Edwin Ewart, as he takes on this responsibility, with you that he might know your protection as he travels around the various churches. And we thank you for retired pastor, Lindsay Allen, and for all of the devoted years of service that he has given to the Association of Churches. So Lord, we just commit all of these people and all of these situations into your care and keeping and ask for your protection upon it. And we pray that we might know your blessing as we seek to further worship you here today. But we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Alfie. Let's sing together once again before we turn to God's word. He leadeth me, O blessed thought. And we'll stand as we sing it together, please. Well, let's turn to Genesis chapter 18. Genesis chapter 18. 
Well, I wonder how you are with unexpected guests. Abraham certainly found himself one with unexpected guests. And you know how it is. Maybe you've, you've settled down for the evening. Maybe just relaxing in front of the TV. Maybe even having a, a quiet nap. And all of a sudden, the bell rings. It's friends who have decided to visit with you. And what do you do? How do you respond? Are you one of those people that just takes it in your stride and goes, come on, no, no, come on in? Or maybe you get a little bit flustered. You know, maybe while one's at the door, the other's quickly rushing around, tidying the sofa. Or maybe you're thinking to yourself, I wonder what biscuits I've got in. Or else you're thinking, you know, hold on, I haven't done the weekly shop yet. What are we going to give them? Do I even have enough milk? I wonder, can you identify with some of those thoughts? I mean, can you identify with that situation? And when you find a very similar situation here as Abraham's visitors arrive, because he's rushing around, there's a, a flurry of activity. But Abraham's not just greeted with one visitor, but three. And we don't know exactly how much time has, has passed here between the events of Genesis chapter 17 when God spoke of these covenant promises. But it's likely not that long has passed. And the reason why I said that was in Genesis 17, it says this time next year, it says that Sarah will have the, the child and the same promise is reaffirmed here. So likely it could have been you know, a matter of even days or weeks, maybe even just a, a month or, or two, even since this, this happened. So it's not long after these previous events. But what we see here is these unexpected visitors we meet. And when we first meet Abraham, here he is sitting at the, the entrance to his tent. Now, even that in itself tells us something, because it said that Abraham had settled in Mamre, uh, near the Oaks of Mamre, but, but still we find him living in a tent. He hasn't set up a, a permanent building or permanent dwelling place, but he's in the tent and he's, he's sitting just at the entrance of it in the hottest part of the day. Now maybe Abraham had finished the work for the day and maybe since it's so hot he's just having a little bit of a rest. But all of a sudden he looks up to see these, these visitors. Now this on itself is a little bit unusual because bear in mind when you travelled in an eastern country normally you wouldn't have travelled during the hottest part of the day. So that in itself was unusual at these, when these visitors arrived. And that gives Abraham a bit of a clue initially that you know this is, this is quite unexpected. People travelling during the, the hottest part of the day. But who are these visitors? Who are these visitors? Notice the way it's recorded in verse 2. They simply seem to appear out of nowhere. Suggesting even that these are no ordinary visitors. Because Abraham simply lifts his eyes and he, he, he sees them. It's as if they were just there. It's not that he spotted them in the, in the distance. That's not recorded. But notice also how Abraham responds to them. I think is equally significant. Because when he sees them, he runs over to meet them. And he bows before them. He clearly views these visitors as, as worthy of respect. It, it may not be bowing in worship. It could be simply just bowing and showing that these are very important uh, figures. And, you know, in biblical times and in Eastern culture, hospitality was extremely important. Um, and the book of Hebrews reminds us not to neglect to show hospitality for, to strangers. Because it says, for some have entertained the angels unaware, thinking even of this passage, no doubt. And this encounter with Abraham proves to be the case. So who were they? The rest of the passage actually tells us who they were. We didn't actually read further down chapter 18, but we'll see clearly who these people were. Cast your eye down to verse 22, and what you'll see is that one is the Lord. One is none other than the Lord, because uh, it says, when the men turned from there and went towards Sodom, Abraham still stood before the Lord. As you read down that passage, there was two of the men went away towards Sodom. Uh, but Abram stands there before the Lord, uh, signifying to us that this was likely the, the angel of the Lord. Uh, um, and we, as we talked about the, that in a previous encounter, why the angel of the Lord, uh, sometimes it speaks to a, of a messenger of the Lord, but other times it speaks of maybe even a pre-incarnate appearance of Christ even himself here. That this appearance of the Lord in front of him, and clearly even the way the Lord speaks through this passage, this, the Lord is present here with Abraham, that is clear. But also the two others are identified as well. <clears throat> and uh, for answer to that, we'll see, uh, if you look at chapter 19 and verse 1, you see it identifies the other two who went to Sodom, <clears throat> excuse me, as angels. It identifies them as angels. 
So here these visitors were with Abraham. There's no indication as such there was anything about their um, appearance. But, and, and I've been wrestling this question during the week. Did Abraham recognize at the very beginning who they were? Um, I think maybe initially, maybe just he saw there was something on them. He realized these figures were, were different. But, you know, certainly he treats them with, well, we know as he treats them with great respect. He treats them, he's clearly viewing the, um, them as, as important. But clearly, even as he talks with them, his understanding is, is growing. You know, we, we're, we're not really, the writer doesn't tell us. He doesn't initially say whenever they appeared in front of him, and Abraham doesn't say, my Lord. He doesn't say that. You know, initially, yes, he does say, Lord, but there it's also a, a title really of respect, uh, really there rather than God. So you notice in verse 3, he, he does guess one is their leader calls him Lord, and a Hebrew word there was, as I say, more a title of, of respect. But he says, my Lord, if I've found favor in your sight, please don't let your servant pass by. Abraham insists that they don't go, that they remain with him. So he's not a reluctant host. He's one who's eager to show them hospitality. He gives them opportunity to, to clean up. You know, and as I say, the reason why also I, I think he didn't fully recognize or fully realize if he thought that initially that this was God himself in front of them, you know, I think Abraham would barely even be able to lift his eyes. He, he would be in fear, I think, as well, of how even Abraham responded. Now, we could argue either way on that, couldn't we? And I was wrestling with this question during the week. And, but the answer's not clear from our passage. But he, he certainly doesn't want the, uh, these people to go. He wants them to stay with him. But as the Lord talks with them, it becomes increasingly clear exactly who he's talking with. Uh, but he, he says to them, look, don't pass by. He gives them an opportunity to clean up. He says, let a little water be brought so you can wash your uh, feet. You know, walking in the hottest part of the day would have meant their feet would have been warm and dusty and the cool water would have refreshed them. He also says, look, you can rest yourself under the tree uh, so they can get out of the sun and, and relax. He says, uh, I'll even bring you a morsel of bread to refresh and, and strengthen yourselves. And then you can go on your way if you want. He wants them to stay since they've come to him, showing this, this hospitality. But the writer gives us a glimpse of actually what happens behind the scenes. Abraham may have you know, appeared like the, certainly the, the gracious host in front, but behind the scenes there's a flurry of activity. Because instead of offering, uh, and here he's being the classic you know, uh, gracious host, because when he talks about a morsel, it's more like a feast. Actually, he runs, uh, and notice the urgency in verses 6 to 7. The word quickly is mentioned three times. Abraham runs quickly to Sarah. Now, remember, here's a man who's age 99 at this point, as tells you even how he views these visitors. He, he runs quickly with urgency, and he says, quick, get three measures of fine flour, and uh, quick, Sarah, make some cakes. Make some cakes, and the cakes we're talking about is not of the fresh cream variety, I should say. These are cakes of bread to make cakes of bread. And he doesn't stop there. He then runs out to his herd and he takes the best of, his, uh, of the herd, one of the young calves, one that was tender and good, and he gives it to one of the servants to kill, to cook, and to, for them to eat. He goes even and gets curds and milk and he, he sets these things before him and he's he set before them this lavish meal and he stands by them and, and watches them under the tree while they eat. He is behaving like a, a gracious host. You know, and that was, that even told you how Abraham treated actually tells us something of how he sees these people as well. Because, you know, Abraham, remember, was the, the head of this household. And, you know, when you think of a household, you know, thinking this is, well, a small family. But actually, when we think of a household, we're encompassing all who lived with Abraham here. And he had many servants by this stage. Hundreds, even as well, was here. So several hundred people were actually gathered here. Abraham was the one who was the head of, of this uh, household group. Uh, he was a man who was advanced in years. He was a man of means, a man of some standing actually in Mamre as well. Yet he's the one who serves the people. He doesn't say to one of his servants, like, would you go out and do it? No, no, he wants to do it himself. He seeks to care for the visitors. You know, and there is, I think, a lesson in hospitality uh, as well here too. You know, we should be willing to, to care for others, to care even for strangers as well, to show hospitality, to, to, to welcome others. 
Not only does it say that in Hebrews 13 as well, but in the New Testament we're reminded that when um, other believers welcome, when we welcome other believers as your strangers, what we're actually doing is it, we're doing it as if we're welcoming the Lord. Matthew 25 verse 35 and verse 40 says, For when I was hungry and you gave me food, I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. Truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of my brothers, you did it for me. You did it to me. You did it to me. We're to welcome others as if we would welcome Christ himself. How challenging that is. You know, and it is good for us to, to welcome others when they, when they come in. You know, and uh, we had some visitors with us last week from, from Grange. Actually, they were on holiday uh, just in the area here and they decided to, to pop in. But it's, it is a, a, an important thing even that we welcome other brothers and sisters in Christ. That we extend that, that welcome to them. And even, even hospitality can be important in that as well too. Uh, you know, when we have our time of hospitality, our time of refreshments, even after the service and on Sunday night, and that's a, that's a wonderful thing. It's a good thing to have that fellowship with one another because it reminds us in the Christian life, we're not just to, to live in, in isolation from one another. We need one another. We are a family, the family of God, and we need that fellowship because we can even encourage one another in that family. We can, we can share with one another, and, and you can't really sometimes sort of share and chat with one another when you're, you're maybe just seeing someone in the, the seat in front of you for a few minutes, or, or maybe you know, you're on your way out of church and you have a brief chat in the car park. But there's something about, isn't there, chatting over a, a cup of tea or coffee or, or chatting over a meal? And very much in Eastern cultures, the, the, the aspect of a meal was, was important. Uh, it signified fellowship as well. And Abraham found himself literally attending to the Lord. Perhaps he didn't realize it initially, but he was going to realize it very, very soon. And we'll see that even by what he says next, but also even what he says next week as well. So here we see these unexpected visitors. But then we see, and there's talk of then the promised son. And Sarah's laughter, or Sarah's doubt. You know, as all this is taking place and the visitors are eating, they ask about Sarah, Abraham's wife. Abraham replies, well, she's in the tent. And there's nothing unusual about that in, in Eastern, Middle Eastern culture. Normally the wife wouldn't have been among the, the male visitors. Um, so she wasn't present here, but, but she was listening inside. She was listening inside uh, the canvas of the tent, or whatever that tent was made out of. And, and she was listening to what, the, what was being said. And so when one of the visitors, who the writer declares to us in verse 10 that this is the Lord, he says, I return to you about this time next year, and Sarah, your wife, will have a son. And all the while, as Sarah continues to listen, and as she hears this, she just can't take this in. You know, obviously Abraham had told Sarah before about the, the covenant promises. But yet it seems those covenant promises just, it seemed too wonderful for Sarah to comprehend. <clears throat> Abraham had no doubt had told her these before, but this does remind us of something as well too. We do see her doubt. And it reminds us, notice how the writer emphasizes in verse 11 repeatedly the difficulty of their situation. He tells us in verse 11, by this stage both Sarah and Abraham were old. He reminds us of that. But it's almost like to underscore that point, to really make that point to us, the writer repeats it several times. He goes on to say they were advanced in, in years. Advanced in years. So not only were they old, they were advanced in years. That's him like drawing an underline onto this. But also not only that, he says the way of women had ceased to be with Sarah. So he's telling us she was past childbearing age. So three times he's told us, really emphasizing the difficulty of this situation. So humanly speaking, he's, he's telling us a normal conception is not going to be possible. Humanly speaking. And after Sarah hears this, it's, it's too much for her to take in. She, she responds by laughing. She says, after I'm old and worn out and Abraham, my Lord, is old, how, how will I have pleasure? You know, we saw last week how when Abraham received the news that in a, a year's time he would be father to his son. And he laughed as well. But yet the response is different. And why did I say that the two laughters were different? You're thinking to yourself, sure, a laugh's just a laugh. Well, when Abraham laughed, he wasn't rebuked. 
Abraham's laugh was one. He just, he was in amazement and wonder. And it was, it was just too wonderful for him to take in. But Abraham still had a measure of faith that, that God was going to grant this promise. He didn't know how, but he just knew God was going to do it. But Sarah's laugh came from a very different place. And why do I say that? It's because of the word of rebuke that issues here after. Sarah, remember, had been childless for a long time now. She was 90. She'd had disappointments. Her plan to have a child through a surrogate, and that was her plan, not God's. But that plan didn't work out how she thought. And maybe Sarah thinks to herself, I'm not getting disappointed again. Maybe there's this hardness of heart that had built up within Sarah. She says, no, no, this, this can't happen. And so the Lord asks Abraham, why did Sarah laugh and say, how can I bear a child when I'm old? Now notice the Lord's supernatural knowledge. And the reason why I say it's a supernatural knowledge, verse 12 tells us Sarah laughed to herself. She laughed to herself. She didn't laugh out loud. She laughed to herself. It wasn't that this was overheard by the visitors outside. The Lord knows. The Lord knew where Sarah was. The Lord knew what was in Sarah's heart. The Lord knew what was in Sarah's mind. And so notice what he says next. Is anything impossible for the Lord? Is anything impossible for the Lord? At the appointed time I'll come back to you. And about this time next year she'll have a son. And and God delights you see in doing what's impossible. God delights in doing what is marvelous. He's the one, remember, who created this world from nothing. He created this world from nothing just by speaking. He's the one who was able to judge the world with a great flood. He was the one who was able to confound the people's language at Babel as well. He's the one who can do all things. And so, as believers, we should never limit God. These things which seemed a barrier, humanly speaking, to Abraham and Sarah, were not barriers to God and sometimes we can be like that you know when we pray we pray and sometimes when we our prayer is answered but it's it's like we're we're amazed but you know we should be praying in faith believing God can answer and it's good for us when we pray to remind ourselves of the one who we approach to remind ourselves of his might to remind ourselves of his power and to know that he hasn't changed God can still move in whatever way he wishes And when God confronted Sarah, here's the thing, she denies laughing because she's afraid, yet the Lord knows. Her unbelief here is sin. We don't know whether Sarah at that point realized who the visitors were. Maybe if she had, she wouldn't have reacted in that way, I would suggest, in the first place. Because to laugh at God is, is basically declare God a liar. To laugh at what God was saying to her was basically saying, I don't believe that. And that's often how it is with with sin. Because with Sarah, one sin led to another. First there was disbelief. But then the sin turns into lie as well. Because she lies when confronted about it. God knew her, her sin. And yet the wonder is God's grace in this instance. God had made this promise to Abraham, this promise to Sarah. And he was going to continue to keep it. Even despite the frailty. Of Sarah's faith. Even despite Sarah's sin. She she didn't deserve this. But yet God was going to keep his promise. See God still keeps his promise. He doesn't break that promise. And God still to the sinner today. uh, Extends his mercy. To those who seek his, his mercy and grace. See God knows our struggles. God knows our doubts. And he knows even our hearts before him today. He knows all about our pains and our sorrows. And the Lord cares. If you think others don't care, the Lord cares. The Lord doesn't overlook these things. He cares deeply for us. And and thankfully, despite Sarah's doubt, God's promise prevailed. The laughter of unbelief is going to be transformed into the laughter of faith. Because the Almighty God is going to make his character known to this woman. And he and his grace is going to, she's going to respond later in faith. Hebrews 11, 11 reminds us, By faith Sarah herself received power to conceive when she was past the age since, since she considered him faithful who had promised. This was no doubt after this word of rebuke. She then believed. 
she believed and God granted that promise and that promise was only transformed by his power. See, God transformed her situation by his grace and by the might of his power. And you know, sometimes when we pray, sometimes we can limit God when we pray because sometimes all we see is the obstacle. And for us, humanly speaking, we can't comprehend how is this ever going to be overcome? How is God move in this situation? Yet the Bible repeatedly tells us God's ways are higher than ours. It it pictures a God. He is all-powerful. He's greater even than the mightiest of nations. He's the one who knows all things. You know, in in one of his letters uh, to Erasmus, Martin Luther said to him, he rebuked him and said, you know, your thoughts of God are too human. Sometimes maybe that's the problem. Sometimes we maybe think of God only in human terms. You know, God knows all things. God knows the true motives of people's hearts. God knows, and God is all-powerful. And we can sometimes limit God when we pray, but we must remember the one to whom we approach. A.W. Tozer writes that since he has at his command all the power in the universe, the Lord omnipotent, that means all-powerful, can do anything as easily as anything else. All his acts are done without effort. He he expends no energy that has to be replenished. The Lord doesn't need to rest after he has done something wonderful and powerful. His self-sufficiency makes it unnecessary for him to look outside of himself for a renewal of strength. God is sufficient in and of himself. He is all-powerful. He is all-sufficient in command everything in the universe. And despite uh, Sarah's age, God's promise was going to be fulfilled. She did receive that strength from God to bear a son. The Lord was meeting Sarah and Abraham's need. And the Lord meets our need as well. You know, one of the Puritans, a man called Stephen Charnock, wrote um, a series called uh, On the Existence and Attributes of God. And it's a, it's a powerful work. It's, he, he explores each of these different attributes of God. And expands on them. And he says, if only we would meditate more on the greatness of God. It would remind us that God's power, it's like like an ocean that we can't fathom. Weren't we thinking about that on Tuesday night? The unsearchable riches of Christ. His power is like an ocean that can't be fathomed. The comforts from it are like streams, he says, that can't be exhausted. And it's comforting to know that there's nothing so difficult that he can't accomplish. There's nothing so strong that he can't overrule. And so he says, you don't need to dread men since you have one who can restrain them. You don't need to fear devils since you have one who is able to chain them. See, God is more than able in our situation. He is more than able. So why don't we remember this more often? He is more able to take care of our burdens. So why don't we, sometimes we fail to bring our burdens to him as we ought to. When we are burdened down or weighed down, sometimes we're more willing to pick up the phone and chat to someone else than we are actually to speak to the living God first and foremost. God is able. God is all powerful. And here was a situation which, humanly speaking, seemed impossible. Sarah couldn't take it in. Sarah, uh, in her case, just couldn't see how this could ever come to be. Yet God was going to overrun. And how wonderful it is, in these closing moments, that we have a gracious God. One who does see even our doubts and our, our struggles. But yet he's one who still delights to use us in his service and glory. And he had a plan for Abraham and Sarah. And so, praise God, not even the, the, the frailty of Sarah's faith was going to hinder God's sovereign plan. He could have turned around easily and, and said, no, Sarah, that's it. You've laughed. No, I'm, I'm going on now. But God didn't. Why? Because God is always faithful to his word. God is always faithful to his word. And that's why in life, whenever you read those, those, those promises of God, you need to, to cling to them. There's a story once told some, some years ago, and I'm sure maybe you've heard this already, of, of a, a woman who passed away, and the, the family found her, her Bible. 
and written throughout her Bible. She, she, she wrote in various places. There was verses highlighted, verses underlined. And then she wrote T and P beside some of these verses. And you can, they find this right the way through the Bible. And they couldn't work out, what, what is this? T and P beside this? What? And they finally came to one verse where it was written out in full. It said, tried and proved. She had tried that promise of God. She'd held on to that promise of God. And she had proved it in her life when she'd seen God answer. You know, it's good for us to hold on to those promises of God. It's good for us to be reminded of them as well. Because when that overwhelming situation blindsides us in our life, we're tempted to lift our eyes off God and on to that and focus only on that. When in that moment, what we need to do is lift our eyes up to the Lord. And to take that promise maybe that we have read, that promise that maybe it came up in our daily readings and, and hold on to it and remind ourselves God is faithful. You know, we should never limit the Almighty God. We should not fail to pray, but rather that's the most important place we need to turn. We need to turn to God in prayer at all times. There was a, a woman who uh, used to go to Shankill and she often used to say these words. The woman's in, in glory now, but she, whenever something happened in, in her life, she would always say, my heavenly father has planned it all. My heavenly father's planned it all. He knows it all. And that's what she was trusting in. God's sovereign purpose for her life. I reminded you that, didn't I, in the opening psalm this morning? And can't the, the great creator, the one who put the very stars in place, the one who formed the planets, can't he move in impossible situations? Though we can't always see the way ahead, our heavenly father has planned it all. Though the things that are happening in the world all around us make us sometimes despair, our heavenly father knows all about them. Are they going to hinder God's plans? Not at all. In fact, these things are only seeking, they even, uh, those plans seek to advance even because of that. All things are advancing according to God's sovereign time scales. The Lord alone is the one who knows when even he, his son will return again. And he will return as he promised. You know, unlike Abraham, some people can, can look at believers, and can laugh at believers for believing that. But yet, it may have taken some years in Abraham's life, but God did answer his, his prayer. God did answer his prayer. God kept his promises. And God's promise is going to be fulfilled. His son is returning again. And so we serve a great God. A great God, an amazing God, an all-powerful God, an all-knowing God. And you know the wonderful thing? Is that the great God comes and wants to have fellowship with us too. He met Abraham at his need. He met, he came just in very ordinary manner to, to Abraham. Do you know the Lord comes to us as well? He comes to us and he bids us dine with him. There'll be a day when we will dine at the marriage supper of the Lamb, when we will have fellowship, fellowship with the Lord, unbroken fellowship with the Lord forever. Think how powerful that is. You'd be awed, wouldn't you, if, the, if um, um, our king came and said, um, talk about an unexpected visitor, if he wanted to come along and say, I'd like to go to your house for, for dinner today. But yet the king of the universe wants to have fellowship with us. Think about that honor. Think about that privilege. He wanted that so much that he sent of his son to make a way to him. So that through trusting in Christ, the one who bore the price for our sin, we could enter into his presence, not just to, for a visit, but that we could enter there and abide forever. He's preparing a dwelling place for us. He's preparing a home for us. And so let us give praise to the gracious God of the universe, to the all-powerful one, and to remind ourselves of his greatness, even as we sing together. Let's sing of his greatness now as we sing, O Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all that his hands hath made. 
He is a great God. And so let us stand as we praise him now.
Heavenly Father, we want to thank you that you are a great God. You're the one who is all-seeing, all-knowing, the one who is all-present, the one who is all-powerful. And so, Father, help us to fix our eyes upon you, to remember that when we pray, to remember the one who we approach. Father, it means we shouldn't approach you lightly or flippantly, but, Father, we approach you reverently, recognizing your might, Lord. And forgive us if there are those times, Lord, where we have prayed and we've just been thinking of things only in human terms. And we've lacked that insight or we've forgotten, Lord, that you are one who is able to overcome. In the impossible situation, Lord, you can move. In the time of great difficulty, though we do not see the way, Lord, you do. And so help us to trust in you. And Father, as we see of your might even displayed in these coming weeks, as we consider a very sobering passage in the book of Genesis, Father, we'd ask that you would continue to speak to us. Help us to, as we see about Abraham's walk with God, Lord, deepen our walk with you. Help us to see that Abraham also was a man who struggled at times. Father, sometimes we struggle. Sometimes our faith is frail. But Father, we want to give you thank you. Thank you for your graciousness to forgive and your willingness to come and meet with us. And so, Lord, help us as we seek to to honour you, as we seek to thank you, and as we seek to remember the Lord even now, the means by which we have fellowship with you. Father, help us to glorify your name as we meet around the table now. In Jesus' name, amen. Perhaps you could turn to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. And just while you're turning that up, Sarah is one who doubted God's word. Her situation seemed helpless, seemed hopeless. And she and Abraham were unable to help themselves, unable to achieve these promises on their own. And it was only going to be by God's intervention and by God's power. Yet nothing is too hard for God and the one who formed the world. And he's already done the the hardest thing, because when God the Son became one of us, when he took on human flesh, when he died for our sins, his mother Mary, wasn't she reminded of the same thing whenever the incarnation took place, that nothing was impossible with God. But that wasn't the only amazing thing surrounding Jesus, the greater promised Son, because God the Father is going to fulfill his purpose through him in order to bless many. Paul reminds us in Romans 5, verses 9 to 10. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. Much more, now that we are reconciled, we shall also be saved by his life. I want to add a reading there just at verse 10. Nothing is impossible with God. Not even the fact, Paul says here, that guilty sinners can be pardoned. Because Paul tells us how God did that. He justifies us through Christ shedding his blood. He declares us righteous because Christ took our sin upon himself. And he paid the punishment that we deserved upon the cross. Now, through faith, God looks upon us You know, now through faith in Christ, God looks upon us, we who were once guilty. He sees us now as cleansed, forgiven, pardoned. Now the debt of sin is against us no more. Why? Because Christ has paid it in full. Nothing is impossible with God. Not even that guilty sinners can be pardoned. Nothing is impossible with God. Not even the fact that people deserving judgment can be saved from God's wrath all because of his promised son, 
who bore our wrath. Paul speaks about that here in these verses. No longer do we go through life wondering, wondering about our standing before God. Have we done enough? No, because Christ has done it all. Christ has paid the debt for us. We know the verdict already when we stand before God. If we're trusting in Christ, he's justified us, declared us righteous by faith. We'll be clothed in Christ's righteousness on the day of judgment. Nothing is impossible with God because the fact that he can take people who were once separated from him, people who were once even enemies, Paul says in God's sight, people who were even hostile to him, once deaf to his voice, and for those who were once enemies of God, well, God gave the Prince of Peace, the one who reconciles us through faith. Now instead of enemies, instead of children of wrath, now we're children of God. Children of God. We're saved not just because of his death, but also, Paul writes here, because of his life as well too. Nothing is impossible with God. The fact that sinners can be forgiven, forgiven, justified. Nothing is impossible with God that that people who were once deserving of judgment can now be declared children of God, part of his family, saved. Nothing is impossible with God. The fact he can take people who were enemies and welcome them into that family, justified, saved, reconciled. But the great wonder of it is there's more to come with our wonderful, amazing, great God because as God works within us, we're not just justified, saved, and reconciled. We're also being sanctified. God's working in us, in our lives, continually changing us into Christ's likeness. And praise God, one day we're going to be glorified. And as Paul writes in Romans 8, 32, he who did not spur his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? All these things come to us through Christ, through the one who gave of himself on the tree, through the one who shed his blood for us. Justified, saved, reconciled, sanctified, and praise God, one day glorified. May God bless us and help us as we Give thanks to the Lord for all that he has done in our lives. The Lord Jesus, on the night when he is betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Wounded for me, wounded for me. There on the cross he was wounded for me. Gone my transgressions, and now I am free, all because Jesus was wounded for me. Our Father, as we take the bread this morning, we want to thank you for your great love, your mercy, and your grace, for going all the way to Calvary to die in our place. And we ask you, as we take this bread and pass it from hand to hand, that you would bless it and use it in your service. Amen.
thank you, Father, again for the opportunity to gather around your table. Thank you, Lord, for reminding us that you are a God who deals with impossibilities. And we thank you, Lord, for the wonderful truth that we guilty sinners can one day be with you in glory, not through anything that we have done ourselves, but through the precious shed blood of your Son, our Saviour, the Lord Jesus, who gave his life that we might be redeemed. Your word does remind us, Lord, that without the shedding of blood, there can be no remission for sins. We thank you, Lord, the blood has been shed, freely shed, and our Saviour even now sits at your right hand in glory, interceding for us. So, Lord, as, the, as we take of this cup now, please accept our thanks again for our Saviour who shed his blood for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Heavenly Father, we do want to give you thanks for your greatness, for your great plan of salvation, the means by which we are justified, the means by which we are saved, and the means by which one day we'll be glorified. Father, we want to thank you, Lord, that you're continuing to work in our life, sanctifying us, shaping us through your word, transforming us even by the power of your Holy Spirit, working with that word, Lord, using, using that to even transform us more into Christ's likeness. And so, Lord, help us to respond with worship. Help us to respond with wonder, knowing that one day we will experience that fellowship with you. As Abraham even had that time of fellowship, Father, it reminds us that one day we will feast even at a heavenly banquet, Lord, that we will be with you forever. And Father, may that thought fill us with wonder. Lord, help us even as we live on this earth, to be, Lord, people who are reminding ourselves that we are but pilgrims, Lord, on our way to a heavenly home. Lord, that we are just passing through. Lord, help us to set our minds not just in things of this earth, but most importantly in things above. So, Lord, we want to give you thanks for your word which you've given us to guide us and to help us in that regard. And so, Lord, even now, be with us today and speak to us through this word and take us to our homes in safety. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> 